Hello, welcome to the Health In Show, an affiliate program of Homeopathy World Community. You've come to the right place to tune in and participate with your comments and questions. Love is the greatest healer of all. But sometimes, in order to change our emotions, we must take action in other spheres of our lives. We speak with experts in alternative and complementary health fields and hope you will benefit in some small or great way. Remember, you are wherever your thoughts are. Make sure your thoughts are where you want to be. The Health In Show and Debbie. I always want to say a little hello to my friend Debbie. Anyway, we're so happy that you're here. We have a very exciting show in store. I'm very excited. I've been waiting for this all month. And uh, we, um, you know, we always try to bring you, and not try, we bring you the best that there is. And today there's such a buzz about our guests that I'm just thrilled. But let me remind you that you are more than welcome anytime during the show. You have a, an open invitation to call in to 919-518-9773 if you've got a phone, or you can communicate with us through Skype, and that would be to Computers 2K Voice, and that would be voice, not video. And then also we have a wonderful chat going on. It's already buzzing in there. So put your name under the video, and nickname is fine, and you can ask questions, you can comment, whatever you desire from there. So before we get on with our guests, I want to introduce Uta, and then we might have a few other people from the um, Homeopathy World Community Board who are here every time we do a show. Some people are stuck in traffic, but we welcome them anyway. So let me introduce Uta. Hi, Uta. Forgot my microphone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Greetings from Portugal. So uh, you're going to introduce our guest? Yes, I would like to introduce our guest. We have with us today the wonderful Dr. Ken Silvestri, who we're very excited to have on our show today. Hello, Dr. Ken. Hey there. Good to see uh, you. Dr. Ken, thank you. likewise, likewise, Dr. Ken. Dr. Ken has been in practice as a psychotherapist since the 80s. Uh, he holds a PhD from Columbia University in anthropology and psychology. He is the recipient of the National Fellowship in the Social Sciences at the University of Chicago and Pennsylvania. He's a certified homeopath who trained with renowned homeopaths such as Dr. Luke de Shepard and David Little. And uh, he integrates homeopathy in his practice. So we're very excited to hear more about what you do. Hello, Dr. Ken. Where are you coming to us from today? Well, I'm coming from uh, Nyack, New York, which is mm -hmm. about 20 miles up the Hudson River, you know, north of Manhattan. And uh, it's a, a bright blue sky day uh, and warm compared to how it was you know, the last few weeks. So uh, most of the snow is melting. And uh, it's a, a, a new beginning. That's a, that's, a, that's a perfect way to look at it, isn't it? And an entree into our show. I just want to just add a little caveat that a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of speaking with uh, Dr. Ken on the phone. And I had to literally drag myself away and say goodbye. <laughs> because I felt the moment we started talking, you see his smile? The moment I, saw, I felt that smile, I could feel through the phone. So we're delighted to have you. So homeopathy and psychotherapy, tell, like, what's the, how do you connect the two? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I just don't even, you know, I don't believe in opposites that much. Uh, you know, I think homeopathy, um, uh, you know, the type of psychotherapy I do is, uh, you know, based on, you know, I, I did study anthropology and uh, my field was family, family cultural anthropology. And, uh, you know, I was taught to really look at things, uh, you know, more holistically, uh, systemically, you know, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And um, one of my, uh, my favorite, one of my teachers was Gregory Bateson. And I, I just want to start off with a, with a quote, which is my favorite quote. And Gregory would always say many times that the major problems in the world 
are the result of the differences between how nature works and the way people think it works. So in, in nature, there's not a whole lot of paradoxes. I mean, there's paradoxes, but I mean, opposites, you know, there's always a unity that we look for. And so when I uh, started doing, a, uh, being a, a, a psychotherapist and then having my training as a, as a homeopath, uh, I, Luke DeShepard, who I studied with first, was my homeopath. And he said, you know, uh, probably some of the uh, ways that a homeopath can really get into what's happening with a person is to, uh, you know, talk to a psychologist, you know, so uh, I think we're all, I think Hahnemann was probably, you know, a systemic psychologist. And uh, so therefore, uh, to me, it's hard to separate the two. I, I, I blend them and they seem to, you know, come out with uh, what it is that we need to find you know, what it is that helps heal people. Uta, you have a great. question? Um, that's that's a, a great connection. I find too, um, we as homeopaths do have more time in the therapeutic relationship than most conventional doctors, uh, well, all conventional doctors normally have. So um, it's interesting that, of course, in, in psychiatry, you take your time with your patient as well. So I very much agree. I think the two connect very beautifully in that way because we also listen to our patients much yeah. more in depth than a conventional doctor. And I think it's also interesting that as somebody physically heals, many times they need the emotional support going through their physical healing. Because, you know, if you've carried around a physical illness or discomfort for a while, it's become part, it becomes part of your identity. It, or it is your identity. And so uh, it's fascinating to me to be able to, you know, have that support to process somebody through their illness. At, you know, and that's a really that's a nice way to put it because, I mean, also I think you know when we do as a therapist, you know, I see people more ongoingly. You know, a lot of people come for uh, uh, psychotherapy. Uh, you know, will eventually, you know, they hear about homeopathy and I may make a suggestion or so. So in many ways, uh, you know, it's hard to be just the unprejudiced uh, observer, you know, that, uh, and I don't believe that Hahnemann really meant that. I mean, I think that's misinterpreted, especially in, in modern times when we have the internet and so much stimuli, you know, going on. Uh, in, in many ways, we really have to see those connections. Uh, you know, we, we have a nervous system, you know, that's 95% uh, autonomic, automatic, you know, and uh, uh, we get stuck there. And sometimes, you know, the ways to find the similium is to go to the core. Uh, you know, with, with our nervous system, you know, we have the revved up part and, I, and then we have the calm part. But the revved up part, you get stuck, you know, and we're not supposed to save our life 24 hours a day. And uh, what I've been looking at much more is the, uh, the vagus nerve, which is the largest part of the nervous system. Vagus is the, in, in Latin means wandering. Uh, I, I won't go in the depth of that, but it's, it's basically, uh, I think, fair to say that it's our, our, our nerve of compassion. It's our nerve of, of love and smiling, as the introduction said before. And when that's compromised, uh, and it is in many ways when you're in fight or flight, uh, that fear and insecurity takes over. There's a lot of talk now about they call it the polyvagal theory mm -hmm. uh, that you could look at. But when when we're stuck in that fear, you know, uh, it, it it could be very well the origin of of labels like autism and whatnot, and uh, things like homeopathy, or um, you know, the uh, like cures like talk of 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 good psychotherapy. You know, that's why uh, I use a lot of stories. You know, years ago, I remember, you remember the book Chicken Soup for the, uh, for the Mind? Well, there's a lot of remedies in those stories. And sometimes just by talking about that or looking at family legacy, you know, it's just remedies pop up. So I, even if someone comes to me, they don't know anything about that homeopathy stuff that you have on your website. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm figuring out regardless, you know, what it is that, you know, that, that may be needed. And you know, as you know, all our remedies have stories, and they're really profiles of people. So you make that connection. So there's a, 
one thing I learned from homeopathy, uh, from anthropology and homeopathy is that when you're really communicating, you're actually synchronizing your brain rhythms, you know, in and out of awareness, because our subconscious is, you know, processes stimuli like at 30 million per second, and our conscious may be only 30 uh, per second. So that's a, you know, a 30 a million, what was that? 30 million to one ratio. So it's really important for us to look, as you said, Marilyn, at the mind and the body, and, and it's not static, it's constantly moving. And, and you know, it takes two to know one. That's what I also learned from, uh, uh, from Gregory Bateson and, uh, and, from, uh, and Margaret Mead would say, many to know many. Yeah. You, know, you can't just isolate something. We have to look at the, the connection. Well, you just said like a whole bunch of stuff in there that I want to like get to, and I'm sure Uta does too, but I want to make sure that everybody says hello to our favorite Dr. Deepak. You there? Can yes. you hear me? Hey. So just real quick, you're in, you're in where? Just tell everybody where you are so they can understand. Yes. So uh, uh, I'm really sorry uh, that I'm getting late for the show, but really, uh, Dr. Ken, you are uh, really good. I uh, read about you, and uh, there is rare uh, person in homeopathy. Those are psychotherapists. So we need actually the homeopathy need the psychotherapist and the uh, good consultant so that homeopathy can explore. So, sir, we are uh, really uh, need to hear you more and more about your journey and from the psychotherapy to the homeopathy. And you also worked with the Dr. Lekdi Shepard. So this is really a wonderful experience for you. So please share your journey from psychotherapy to homeopathy. Surely, surely. Um, as I was saying, it was, just, it was very natural. I mean, when you're more, when you, when, so the way I do psychotherapy is I, I always look at you know, first of all, what people's perspectives are, you know, how they, who oh, I apologize for that. Um, you know, if, if someone's looking at things in a very, you know, narrow kind of perspective, uh, there's usually a, a constraining, you're constraining a lot of your emotions and stuff. So, you know, the first thing I always look at is, you know, what is it that you're not getting? You know, what is it, where are you and where do you want to be? And that gives us our perspective. And, you know, then we look at temperament. You know, there's the, our, our remedies are, or as I was telling Uda, they're, they're stories, uh, they're profiles. And, uh, and we know, you know pretty clearly that certain remedies are only going to work with certain temperaments. And so we have to look at those Hippo Hippo Hippocratic, you know, the thinker, the, the feeler, uh, the, the uh, sanguine person, the sensational person. You know, those, the extremes are you know, not too good sometimes. You could be a hose out of control and be a sensate pro person, but you could be the salt of the earth also. And that's where the, where the balance we look for when we look for remedies. And, you know, again, looking at things systemically after finding out what it is that their perspective is, and then you have to look at how is your environment, as Marilyn was saying, it's ongoing. What kind of environment do you have? You know, where's your diet? You know, where's your, your way of, of, uh, of, of protecting yourself? You know, and, uh, and then the journey, I think, begins with uh, possibilities. You know, we need to have a holistic look, uh, outlook on life. And, and if we do that, we use our senses more. You know, where allopathic medicine you have a very, you know, um, kind of narrow view, you know, cause and effect. Um, just recently, I'm, I'm on the faculty of the New York Medical College, which used to be Flower Hospital and was a homeopathic uh, college. And, and they now have a complementary uh, and alternative uh, course. And I'm one of several uh, homeopaths that, that talk. And just recently, last week, I did uh, a, a session. And I didn't just want to, you know, lecture about, you know, homeopathy uh, and psychology, what I had them do was break into groups and talk about each other in different contexts with a theme. You know, my theme was uh, what's continuing, you know, and, and what happened is that they said they never really were talking to each other. And also historically, they know very little about homeopathy. And yet this college was a, a thriving homeopathic college for years and years. So possibilities come out of when you look at things holistically. 
you know, here's the big word, you know, epistemology. That's a word that, you know, I remember when I first anthropology class, I'm from a very working class town, Patterson, New Jersey, where there's all kinds of factory workers and things like that. And, you know, I'm looking and saying, you know, what is this? You know, um, the, the way I got into Columbia, I wrote a poem and they, said, and they put me on probation for a year because I couldn't figure out how to do the, uh, the application. But it, what's, what's happening is that when you have possibilities, you start looking at all the different Im improvisational things that go on. And, and that's, what we, that's how we want the remedies to come to fulfillment. And if they're not, we, we have to alter it. We have to change. And that's what's nice about homeopathy. And then the last part really, uh, you know, not only celebrating these possibilities, I mean, just many different things that you do as artists and whatnot, but I think the journey has to also always mention, and I don't want to go on too much, is that we're fallible. <laughs> we're allowed to make adjustments. You know, a lot of my, you know, uh, uh, homeopathic colleagues, you know, even in the old cases where you give a remedy and they come back in six, you know, two months and everything's supposed to be fine, it just doesn't work that way. You know, the, the world is too much stimuli that, that, that we hold on to. And, and, and we have to, you know, be able to make those adjustments and, and celebrate our fallibility because nature is messy. You know, there's mm -hmm. the, the yin and the yang, yang mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so we have to be very, very knowledgeable or aware that we are in this place of nature. You gave me a very good cue here because I'd like to really, <laughs> the world is a crazy world currently. So, uh, and you mentioned compassion and uh, I'd like to throw in mindfulness and uh, what, do, what today in our time, everything's gone crazy. We're all up, up and beyond ourselves. Um, there is no straight line along which we can follow. We have a completely new situation that we haven't had. Um, the epidemic is, is not only one of a virus, but one that is bringing everybody into a sort of unrest and, and into a state of, of, yeah, fright in a way and anxiety. I know a lot of people are very anxious with what has been going on or is still going on. What are your thoughts? Um, how can we maintain our sanity in this crazy world that is upon us? Well, you know, I think it's so important to have relationships. And I, I mentioned that, you know, it takes two to know one. I mean, individually, you know, we're, we're, we're very vulnerable. And I think we learn from each other. Um, you know, when I work with families, uh, you know, a lot of times they come in uh, for psychotherapy because of conflict. Uh, even people who might come for homeopathy, there's, there's an, usually an inner conflict. And I always ask, you know, what it is that you're, what's your grievance? You know, what is it that you're not getting in the world? Uh, but uh, if you have four, like, and I do this all the time, you have four or five people who are arguing, you know, a lot of time, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, not too long ago, uh, when I was doing uh, my, my sessions live, I had a family, uh, you know, two adults uh, with their three adult children, and they were all yelling at each other constantly. And um, I had just, there's a wonderful Italian bakery down the street from my, uh, my office and a whole bunch in there. So I always try to get a different kind of loaf of bread. And I had one in my, my knapsack and I don't know what possessed me, but they were just arguing. I finally, I said, stop. And I threw my bread, my beloved bread on the floor. And I said, I want each one of you to give five perceptions of, of that bread. You know, and they started, you know, peanut butter and jelly, this and that and that. So basically with, with uh, five people, I got 25 perceptions. They all had to be different. So I basically was saying, okay, you know, and all of a sudden there was more jovial. There was people who were like, they were talking to each other because, you know, like in quantum physics, we have a hundred different possibilities and it will be correct. So that's going to drive you crazy right there. So how do we get into it, being a systemic therapist? And I think homeopaths have to sort of use that word epistemology is, is really respect that they are a holistic legacy. You know, Hahnemann was a, a Renaissance fellow who just was incredible. You know, it was incredible. And far as like uh, not only staying up every other night and speaking all those different languages, also being a, a lover and a, and a, and a, 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 an empath. empath. So the more we start talking about each other to each other and we start developing ways of understanding and, and context is what it's about. 
content. It, yeah, it, it doesn't, it helps us with language, our constraints, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, especially in English, you have subject and predicate, you're lost right there, you're in the allopathic world. Uh, when I first started anthropology, I, I was supposed to uh, spend a lot of time in India. I, I, I had a, a, actually a, a master's in South Asian philosophy, and uh, my language was Tamil. And Tamil was beautiful because there was all, all idioms. And I was, you know, being from Patterson, I, I just fell right into that. It's very poetic. So the more we talk and more we respect each other in context, but here's the, here's the thing, each context is simultaneously part of wider context. Mm -hmm. um, Nora Bateson, who's Gregory Bateson's daughter, a, just a wonderful thinker, she uses uh, a, a terminology, actually I think her father, or her father did coin, transcontextual, which means that you have to look at things in a stereoscopic way. So if I'm with a, a person who's really suffering, and there may be a GI issue or whatever, I have to look at all these other contexts too. And that's why, as a therapist, I do what they call genograms. I do family legacy. So I'm constantly zooming in and, and zooming out. And you can do that. You can do that, you know, whether it be looking at a loaf of bread or whatever. We're all going to have different views, and, but yet we're doing that all the time. And that's what I think really good homeopathy or any good assessment or any good healing is, is to see, you know, the whole and the parts. But for us to get into context. I hope it didn't go on too long with that. But. No, 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 no. Not long enough, actually. I want to keep on going, but I do want to just let everybody say hello to um, Pretty because she Hi, Pretty. did her best to get so, here. <laughs> I'm sorry, the Mumbai traffic, even with the pandemic, has not improved. Hello, Dr. Ken, and I'll accept my apologies for being late. No problem. I just want to ask you one quick little one quick question and then on to the rest. So based on the fact that you're a homeopath and a psychotherapist, do you do telehealth based on like, are you only in New York and New Jersey or because of homeopathy, you can do, I mean, you can do telehealth with homeopathy and oh, by the way, be, be because I know that, you know, with some therapists, obviously you can only stay in where you have your license but considering we're all on the internet now and doing everything on the computer i mean are you able to you know lead with homeopathy and then do a little psychotherapy if you're talking to somebody in timbuktu oh, oh yes yes i i am working with people now from uh even north carolina matter of fact where, where you live from from here from my my uh, home office. Uh, I have uh, people from uh, India, Korea, uh, but it seems to be, uh, I mean, I am licensed, but there's no license for homeopathy, obviously. I mean, if you look at the state requirements in, in New Jersey, you have to graduate from a homeopathic university, uh, which they don't exist anymore. Um, so, um, you know, so I always, you know, have a disclaimer as when I do homeopathy as, a, as part of my I mean, I have a benefit, I guess, that maybe many homeopaths don't have because as a licensed uh, you know, a person who does psychotherapy, I could do nutrition, and I could do all kinds of adjunct work that's integrated. Um, and with the pandemic, they actually uh, waived, uh, you know, state boundaries, and they're still trying to figure that out. Uh, so, you know, my sense is that you know, I'm working from, I live in New York now, I also have an office in New Jersey, uh, you know, I could work you know legally which is always nice to have because uh, you know unfortunately you know homeopathy uh there's a lot of people who are very um have very narrow views about it and don't really you know complain about it or uh, you know poo poo it uh, without looking at the research and uh, there's a lot of zealots there that that are out there and even the fda and uh uh, you know, in the United States, they're saying, you know, maybe they, we shouldn't have belladonna in home in home foods uh, or whole foods or Nux vomica because, uh, you know, th that that's they're dangerous. And you know, they have people who are experts uh, in their field not see the process or go on to, you know, Dana Ullman's you know, wonderful website and the many uh, r wonderful research that's coming at, throughout throughout uh, our world. Our homeopathic world. So yeah, I mean, to answer that question, uh, at this point, you know, I I could do 
you know, I don't have to do it in person. I, I like doing it in person. I like being in that. So I'm, I definitely want to keep my office. But I think like most of my colleagues are saying, we're going to probably be integrating virtual from now on. Exactly. Well, I wanted everybody to know that because it's really important. Because yeah, it's very, it there's a lot of people out here who need, who want and need a therapist, and are really microphone, to Marilyn. Got it. What What'd you say on that? I'm sorry. Yeah, pick it up. Oh, okay. There's a lot of people today who are in need of a good therapist, and having a hard time finding one, and the, to be able to be holistic as you are, because we are a whole package. We're not just a piece of a package. We're a whole package. And to be able to work the whole pa package is vital. So, I, you know, it's important for everybody to know that, especially well, here in the States. Yeah, I mean, just I want to comment on that, too, because, you know, listen, we, we, we know that allopathic, you know, word that was coined by Heinemann, uh, a lot of doctors really are very uh, trained to be in many ways more into cause and effect, uh, though I think things are changing. Like when I, I did, did this recent talk to uh, 20 young physicians that are just finishing their education, uh, they volunteered because they want to know more about their legacy. But here's the thing, and I hope I don't offend my colleagues. I respect my colleagues. I don't uh, in the psychotherapy world, but um, uh, I just wrote an article uh, about, you know, where's the family or where's the system in psychotherapy? Uh, you know, 99% of psychologists only work one-on-one. -on -one. They don't do that zooming in and zooming out. Um, you know, even family therapists, there's a licensed, licensed family therapist, only like, I think it's like 15% even admit to working, you know, with more than one person. It's easy or with insurance and confi con, you know, confines of your office and 45 minutes or whatever the pressures are to sometimes not see peripheral. Us homeopaths are peripheral missionaries. You know, we see things and we zoom back and forth. So unfortunately, I think that a lot of my uh, colleagues in the psychotherapy world uh, would fit that allopathic uh, you know, definition, unfortunately, uh, because they kind of like, uh, you know, see things, you know, one way, or like certain orthopedics, you know, I, I do Aikido, which is a wonderful martial art. It's very, it's all internationally, it's very holistic. It's a peaceful, harmonious way of communicating. Um, I've been doing that for, for many years. And I had one, one friend who had hurt themselves. And uh, we, you know, we have remedies that we use at our dojo. And, uh, but he went to an orthopedic and, uh, you know, had, had a, a lot of trouble with, it, with his right arm. And the, uh, uh, the ortho orthopedic was looking at his hand and stuff like that and said, I could help you with x-rays and we could do some medication. And he said, uh, well, what about my upper part? And the, uh, the doctor said, oh, I don't work below the elbow. I only work below the elbow. <laughs> you know? So I'll, I'm going I'm to refer you to um, you know, someone else. And I, I said, geez, you know, that's really, really interesting because, you know, uh, there's a, a, a connection here, an interdependency. Uh, and that's the other word. Uh, as I talk system, systems, I always say context and interdependency, not, you know, not partnerships. You know, partnership is, uh, doesn't always work. It's like the, uh, uh, I hope I don't offend anybody as far as diet, but like, you know, in the United States, you know, the uh, ham and uh, chicken, uh, let's see, uh, a ham and egg sandwich. You know, uh, if you have a, a chicken and a pig working together, you know, the chicken does, might not mind in that partnership, but the, the pig may have some questions. So I noticed in the health food stores around here, now they have what they call the happy piggy, uh, almost tastes like ham and egg, you know, which, 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 is, which is a collaboration. So we, yeah, so we're, we always think, of how are we interdependent? How's the body interdependent? How do we relate to nature? You know, how do we, that's the very basis, how do we think about nature? And then as you articulate, then we could come up with, you know, the remedies or dance around us. You know, like uh, David Little said, always say, you know, you have satellites. You know, you get, when you get that simulium, but sometimes you have to see how the satellites, you know, change their orbit a little bit. And that's why uh, my sense is that uh, every context changes. You know, and uh, you know, especially when you practice as long as I have, and you see people from who might come back, and a lot of people have come back <laughs> during the, the pandemic. And you can see the evolution, you know, from their, you know, from their uh, repertory, 
And so even when I'm working with people who are not doing homeopathy, I'm still, I'm still doing rubrics. <laughs> You know, so if any any anyone who wants to see my notes about psychotherapy and they start seeing these rubrics, they're going to really wonder <laughs> what's going on here. <laughs> what's what you talking about? Good. All right. So who? Um, which anybody have a particular question, Pretty? Yeah. I actually had one, and um, when I joined, I was hearing this. Um, what I, and I loved what you just uh, said some time back that you were working with the family and you had like twenty five perceptions, right? Uh, so it's beautiful, you know, that we are all living on one earth, but we have as many worlds as many people we are, isn't it? And we take, if we take this example and we go into the dream world, then the possibilities are even more crazy. And as a homeopath and a, and, and a psychotherapist, how do you work with dreams uh, and the different worlds we have in our dreams? Well, it's it's interesting, and I, you know, when I said I I studied with uh, um, David Little and uh, Luke Shepard, who very much look at dreams. I, I have to mention another wonderful colleague, Jane Chiquetti, who wrote a wonderful book years ago uh, on u- utilizing dreams and coming up with with their remedy. So I always spend time, you know, asking people how they are dreaming, either daydreaming or uh, in a in their own trance. Uh, I do a lot of you know, meditation or mindfulness. Uh, uh, I, I am a, practi- a practitioner of a coherent breathing, which I like very much is six seconds in, six seconds out. And when you exhale, thinking of something positive, uh, you usually activate that. Uh, uh, from, you can move from the sympathetic to the, uh, to the parasympathetic. And uh, and also you know brings up a lot of good hormones, uh, you know for uh, the, with, with the cuddle remedy. Oxy, oxy, uh, I can't think of that. And help me out. The, 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 what's the cuddle remedy uh, hormone that comes out when you're in that parasympathetic you know state and you feel cortisol and um, right cortisol and um, yeah, right. right. Dopamine. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I know. Dopamine. Could be dopamine. Yeah. yeah. That, that mm-hmm. could help actually. Um, but uh, I mean, my, you know, my point is, is that, you know, what, our dream states are very important. And in many ways, you bring up, uh, as I mentioned before, a subconscious has seen everything that you've possibly ever seen. And it's in there. And, uh, you know, the, the, the conscious mind doesn't you know, uh, take that many stimuli. So sometimes we can burn ourselves out. But when we're dreaming, we give a better, more permission to our subconscious to allow things to pop up. You know, and again, those remedies will pop up in, in, in dream analysis. So uh, a lot of times I would ask you know, uh, someone to do some coherent breathing because that puts you into that parasympathetic you know, part, which allows the subconscious to give whatever message or whatever things that are, need to be surfaced. You know, our, our body is very complex and, and the complexity of it uh, actually is always maintaining. Uh, there's like that homeostatic you know, principle of how do we maintain health? And a lot of times it'll give you messages. And so, you know, dream analysis or hypnosis at times, because a lot of times if you're, when you're sharing states in an interview, you really are going into uh, an altered state in many ways. It's a, a form of, of, um, uh, of hypnosis. You know, Hahnemann did that and you know, played a lot with, with that and mesmerizing and stuff. And uh, I find that when you're really communicating and you really have that empathic you know, connection, uh, you're in that dreamlike situation. So when you start probing, uh, a lot of, uh, especially when I work with adolescents, they always call me uh, the, the, how, the how man because I'll say, well, how are you doing? And they'll say, so how are you doing that? You know, usually after the fifth how, you're, you're definitely in their subconscious. <laughs> so I just want to ask, are you familiar with heart math? With who? Heart math? No, I'm not. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. they use this very similar process that you were just talking send, about. Send the me breathing the information. Yep. And the coherence and all of that kind of stuff. And that's really important for people to understand that when you're in that state how different the world seems and how how much when you're in that coherent state when your head and your heart are kind of in sync you are in that state of coherence where you're clearer and things you can process things you know in a different way so that's really important um and who else anybody else have any deepak or 
Uta, pretty any comments? Yeah. I just, yeah, just as a follow up and um, uh, as, a, as a practitioner and, you know, also as a, as a layman, uh, a lot of dreams, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm stuck with dreams, but okay, one more question, um, are about symbols. And uh, I don't know if you would want to give some example to the, to the audience that's listening. Like, for example, if somebody's looking at a lot of water in the dreams, what to what does it symbolize if you could just share a few examples well i mean you know i, I like to get people to narrate and and not only just if they're doing the water what's the context you know okay. how are they how are they coming up with that um you know we have we have uh, in our repertories we, we have a lot of rubrics that deal with dreams uh but you really have to be careful and make sure you put them into context uh and uh there's there's so many wonderful symbols that you know that date back to you know uh, our, our human legacy. Uh, so uh, you know there's just it's it's hard to just say you know one thing like dealing with water. It's what's the context, and then what's the the, the wider levels, and where does it bring right. up? Uh, a lot of times I have people do uh, write poetry, uh, not necessarily you know roses are red and violets are blue, but really you know free verse poetry, uh, and usually with a prompt. Uh, like, for instance, if, if you really feel that there's a, uh, uh, an affinity towards water, uh, what would you like to say about it? And then, you know, there's a, there's a moment you're, you're giving an induction and, and that we will bring out uh, things that might be easier to uh, put into the repertory. Uh, you know, you don't want to just put anything there because a lot of our, you know, repertory is archaic, uh, yet wonderful because of the provings. So uh, I, I don't know if I could answer, there's millions of different uh, you know, symbols, but to me, the, the narrative and the poem is the, is the, is the symbol. And, and, and where that goes in, in context is what's really important. And, uh, and like the, uh, the, the Sanskrit word ahimsa, we're always mitigating. So how do we mitigate you know, the inevitable you know, friction or violence and stuff? And, uh, I, you know, I always just, again, I refer to Aikido because Aikido is a, a defensive uh, kind of a enlightening type of, of effective, you know, martial art because you're always working with the, the conflict and lessening it. And then you could kind of be in like, okay, you have two different people, but how do you come together simultaneously and how's the blend? So sometimes I may come up with an entirely different interpretation of a dream or a symbol uh, than someone else would. But that's the joy of homeopathy too, because again, True. you could go to it, get those satellites floating, again, whether it be in uh, using poetry, using just uh, different forms of psychotherapy, different cognitive ways, behavioral ways. Uh, when you're de dealing with, a, 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 again, not using that word all the time, epistemology, but it really is a framework. When you're dealing with a holistic framework, then you have many more options to help someone. And, and, it's, and it becomes very individualized that way. And yet it's still mutual. Mutual learning is what it's all about. I learn every day, I'm learning now. That's how it is. Well Great. said, well said. Uta, did, you get, did anybody else? Yes. I, um, yes. Deepak, go, yes. Sir, I have a question. Uh, become a psychotherapist, and also you are a good home path. So, uh, because this is an open show and open for everyone, what you uh, you recommend homeopathy for everyone? Become a psychotherapist. Why why anyone uh, should take the homeopathy? It's it's interesting. Uh, there there was a book that came out a few years ago. I had a chapter in it uh, by. Uh, Henry uh, Harry, who, who uh, uh, was the editor of Lynx, Lynx magazine, uh, and it was uh, homeopathy and mental health. I was, I thought, it was, I, I believe that was the title, and uh, uh, it, it basically you'll you'll see that uh, that people who are into counseling or therapy have a tendency to be able to, with different skills, probe in different ways. Um, you know, when I first studied homeopathy uh, with Dr. Uh, De Shepper, with Luke, uh, there was maybe a handful of homeopaths. Uh, and I remember when we came to the section on interviewing, um, it wasn't in any way that we were competing, but we were saying, you know, you just can't ask 
one question and sit back and listen. Uh, there's, that's good for, to a certain degree, but you might have to ask meta questions, which are questions about questions. So I'm not saying that you can't be a great homeopath and, and there's, you're all wonderful homeopaths and there are many out there who are not psychotherapists, but I'll tell you, most good homeopaths are psychotherapists anyhow. So I, I give you the honorary you know, psychotherapy license because you're doing much more counseling and, and help and empathy. Uh, but it, you do need to have that interplay. Uh, I think that I remember reading years ago, I believe it was Brian Kaplan from England who wrote a book about communication. And I remember writing an article about that and many you know, people criticized me saying, well, you know, uh, you can't be, you have to be the unprejudiced uh, observer. Uh, as an anthropologist, I'm a participant observer. And then, in other words, you, you, you have to get right in there. And I'm not saying that you have to in any way alter or tell someone or pass judgments. But when you're really relating, you know, uh, uh, I mentioned Nora Bates, Bateson and transcontextual, which would look at the wider level. She actually coined a word that's wonderful. It's called somathesy, which really means mutual learning. We, when, we, when we do, you know, our, uh, what she calls the warm, warm data uh, process, it's all about interaction and how we are interdependent and how you can bring these different contexts into play by talking about it. So all of a sudden your life becomes alive. And when it comes alive, that's the remedy. You know, so, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think that it would be good to, if, if homeopaths start thinking more holistically and utilize their wonderful empathy because I haven't met a, a homeopath that, that's malicious. I mean, I haven't, <laughs> you, know, you, usually get, you usually get in there, you know, with, with a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, feeling and, and objectives to help. I think some psychotherapists, they might get into a power trip, you know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you, sir. Thank you so much. Also, you uh, really said too that uh, the Dr. Henneman was a good scientist, was a good doctor, then uh, he was a homepath. So homepath was the last degree of uh, Dr. Henneman, sir but he really is a good scientist and have a specialization in the chemistry. So homeopathy word is need the good scientist, especially from the chemistry world so that homeopathy can approve. Or uh, this is not a work of our physicians that we will prove the sci science of homeopathy behind homeopathy. So we need a good scientist. And uh, I also observed that, uh, and I, we all are homeopath, and, Homeopathy is the only science which connect the mental state of the patient with the physical journals. I study yeah. the Chinese medicine, I study Arabian medicine, I study the acupuncture, acupressure, and hizama cup therapy, many therapies I studied, but uh, they never relate the mental state with the physical journals. Uh, do you agree, sir? Yeah, I agree. I mean, listen, one of the things that, first things that popped out of, my uh, reading of the organon is when Hahnemann said that, you know, the mental and emotional symptoms are going to tip the scale. And so I, I, you know, I definitely look at generals. I definitely look at temperament. I definitely look at context and stuff, but you know, a lot of times uh, the, the barriers to healing are what we're, we're stuck in certain mental situations. And given again, that our, our, our lifestyle and, uh, the different stimuli that we have, uh, we have to really look at our nervous system and look at our, how secure we are as, as, in, as humans. And a lot of security helps, again, with mutual learning, mutual sharing, collaboration, uh, but we have to deal with the, with the, the, the emotional you know, issues because it does tip the scale. And a lot of times when you deal with that, uh, all of a sudden, uh, other and other things pop up. I mean, I remember you know studying anthropology, and I was lucky to study with really good people. Um, uh, Margaret Mead, Gregory Bates, and my, my mentor was Paul Byers, and he would really look at. He would hook us up so we knew that we were like in biofeedback, that we were really communicating and stuff. But when we used to do assessment of, of families and people, a lot of times people would have like it's like peeling an onion. When you got rid of the emotional, all of a sudden the physical thing popped up and then we could really deal with that. Otherwise we were just kind of shooting in the dark. So you really have to, in many ways, you know, really look at the mental, emotional, and at the same time, simultaneously see the connection. 
but sometimes you have to, you know, peel that onion to get to that. Uh, and that was, you know, how uh, obviously some of our famous homeopaths, you know, dealt with the process of healing. You know, from the top down, bottom, all these different things from the different organs. Yeah, you know, it does work. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great question. Well, we don't want to, I mean, we want to keep on going, but we do have um, somebody on our chat who wants you to uh, repeat the breathing technique that you did with the five seconds in the diaphanatic breathing. Could you just repeat the process? Sure. It's, it's called coherent breathing. Uh, Stephen Elliott uh, is the person who really uh, researched it and has refined it. And you could go on his website as coherent, coherence uh, or Stephen uh, Elliott. But it is basically uh, what it what it is is that to find a rhythm where it's six seconds in as you breathe in, and then as you breathe out and exhale, you really think of something that's very positive, and this kind of activates uh, you know the, the, the vagus nerve, and it sometimes will will soothe it. And uh, by doing this, uh, it's amazing. You find yourself very balanced. Uh, your uh, the heart rate variable is, is uh, put into a, a very healthier uh, rhythm. Uh, and it's just, you know, there's other yogic uh, forms of breathing, uh, but coherent breathing uh, to me, uh, usually I have people after they take a remedy, just do like five, 10 minutes of breathing and, or even at the beginning of a session, uh, which also as, as Pritya said, uh, you know, would bring up, uh, you know, uh, dreams and, and feelings from the subconscious uh, because it's a way of, of basically the only way out of the sympathetic nervous system when we're stuck and not, you know, and, and, and saving our life 24 hours a day, which is not healthy, you know, the blood leaves your frontal brain, goes to your arms and legs, you're not supposed to exist that way. And for some reason, uh, you know, the way we're made uh, is that, uh, you know, it's 95% auto autonomic or automatic, the, our nervous system, but breathing is that segue. And, and as Steve Elliott researched, that, that, that cadence seems to quicken the way into switching into the parasympathetic or the calm part, you know? And that, again, you know, affects our vagus nerve, which is connects our, you know, our, from our brain to our gut, to our arms, our heart, you know, all the metabolism. Uh, and it, again, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the brain, uh, it's the, the, or, uh, the nerve of compassion. Uh, there's a wonderful book about it. Uh, uh, it's called uh, Born to be Good. Uh, and the author is, um, uh, like, like I'm trying to think, uh, it's Dasher Keltner, uh, a difficult name, but a wonderful person. Dasher Keltner wrote a book on the vagus nerve, Born to be Good, and it talks about the nerve, uh, that the vagus nerve being the nerve of compassion and security. And I think a lot of homeopaths have to look at that. And a lot of our rubrics on fear have to really be, you know, re- you know, uh, re reused in many ways or, or, or recontextualized into uh, contemporary uh, living. And I think we'll, we'll find different ways of uh, getting away from those labels of autism and whatnot and deal with what it is that, you know, people are evolving with. I'd like to just add something about that breathing is that it affects our energetic and our physical heart. Yes. That's very, very, very important also. So it's, a, and that's, you know, really important breathing. And are you familiar with the Global Coherence Project that was done many years ago? Yes, when I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's part of it. Yeah, right. it is. Yeah. Cool. And just to add to this um, beautiful description that you said, Dr. Ken and Marilyn, that you added uh, from a scientific perspective, and because I use a lot of meditation in my practice, and I'm from India, uh, another way to look <laughs> look at it is that breathing is the is the only uh, uh, tool that we humans have that connects the physical with the mystical, mm. uh, and uh, something that you can see, feel, but yet do not know where it goes or what it does. So this is a way, and hence since ages. This is a technique that's used by mystics, by for meditations, for healing. And of course, science explains it. But I think as homeopaths and healers, this connection between the physical and the mystical 
I think breathing does it very well. And hence, if you just ask the patient to close eyes and just breathe, and the technique that you said was brilliant, uh, it just opens up a lot of things, yeah? It Because does. it connects them with something which they're not aware in their conscious mind. And, and I'm convinced that it, it takes away barriers for, for the remedies uh, to, to be effective. You know, I mean, you know, so we've all met, you know, situations where there's a lot of resistance. Uh, and uh, it, when you just do a little bit of mindfulness, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's non-toxic, you know, it's, as is homeopathy. Uh, you'll see the effectiveness. And at, over, over the years, the longer you practice, you start seeing this. Uh, and sometimes you have to make sure that people are breathing and getting out of that sympathetic nervous system. It's very hard, you know, when you're saving your life at, at moments when you should not be having to do that, uh, to try to get a remedy to just snap you out of it. You know, you need to get out of that, that state, that nervous part of your nervous system that's hindering, you know, uh, you from really allowing uh, the remedy to, to take hold. And again, it's not, you know, a remedy could be uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, poem or a statement, you know, a, a like or is like in, on that level, uh, you know, as uh, uh, was it Boninghausen or who, who was the one, the famous homeopath who went to an opera about grief, you know, and then realized that, uh, that there was something there by hearing other people's grief that he was able to uh, handle his own, you know, his own grief a little differently. I also wanted to ask you, I guess, it's very important to be able to do all this because, you, you know, even if you bring up a remedy, people have to, their, their emotional, psychiatric, psychological self has to have, they have to accept it. So we have to kind of, it's like a, it's a game that we kind of play back and forth to be able to get into a position with the breathing, to be able to do the vagus nerve, to have that, you know, working with, so we're in a position to receive. Okay. And that's why I like the, the mutual learning because you actually, you know, your, your brain rhythms actually become, there's a phase lock. It's like being on an escalator. You know, my Italian ethnicity, you know, now I'm thinking about bread, I'm thinking about my hands and stuff like that. But if we're working, walking up on an escalator, there's something that's common. You know, the escalator is moving at a certain uh, speed and our feet are, are maybe, you know, a little bit more solid. And I think that the, the more you, you do that, the more you realize that we have different rhythms that we have to volley. So the mutual learning actually allows us to connect and then move on into other contexts together. Uh, and then maybe being, realizing that one thing leads to another. And when we start thinking of how interdependent we are with nature, uh, with our food, uh, with our uh, way we process things, uh, all of a sudden you're, you're in a different mindset. And then, of course, we have different temperaments. You know, we're human, uh, but we still have to respect the temperaments. Uh, you know, and we also have to respect how we access things. Uh, you know, like in the old days when they, they, there was a, a, a technique called neuro-linguistic programming. You know, some people, you know, are more uh, visual and some people are more tactile. You know, some, there's olfactory things. You know, you're not going to say to a person who's very, very visual, you know, uh, I hear you, I hear you, maybe I see what you're doing. And those are techniques that homeopaths uh, sometimes overlook. And it's not manipulation. It's joining. It's collaborating. It's how am I interdependent with you? So, you know, I have that different feeling. I, I may have five different views on that loaf of bread, but you know what? They're all correct. So how do we, you know, how do we work together? And, and you know, in a sense that, that we form this collaboration and respect what's out there. This is great. I don't even want to yeah. stop. <laughs> We're going to kidnap you. <laughs> We're not going to well, let you, you off our airwaves. <laughs> yeah, I do have a question, and it goes into a little bit of a different direction, but into your direction, I suppose, because uh, I want to ask you about your book, How to See Your Life Differently. What do we have to see differently in our lives? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful question, because... Uh, one of the things I learned from homeopathy, and again, I, I defer back to Gregory Bateson, uh, he, he always said that what we're looking for is a difference that makes a difference. So if you're looking at things ecologically, 
you know, it's not just like cause and effect. You know, we could, you know, we could make a difference, but a difference that really makes a difference is connected to all the wonderful parts of our, of our world and of our own essence of who we are. So in my book, I talk you know, about homeopathy. I mean, it comes, it threads right through. I'll talk about families of origin. Uh, I talk about double binds or communication things because you know, when we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, we're not gonna go anywhere. Physically, you know, mentally, communication wise, but how do we get out of that? The difference is to widen our, you know, again, zooming in and zooming out. So it's, you know, my, my individual, you know, uh, journey, as you mentioned before, uh, to see, you know, how is it that we could make differences, you know, not be static. Uh, we can't change the past. We can't condone it. Don't get me wrong. You can't minimize. But uh, for instance, the true uh, definition of forgiveness is not to minimize or condone the past. It's to be in the present where you can work things out so you don't rent too much as the Italians say, agita in your head, where you're just going to have a barrier, and you're not going to be able to <laughs> to move to move forward. Uh, so it's, it's it's kind of my 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 view, uh, and I put a lot of questions in there because I like asking questions. I like doing prompts. I talk about poetry. I talk about you know different ways of of making changes, of respecting your temperament, you know. Uh, and to uh, allow yourself to uh, uh, be part of that messy, wonderful thing of what we call nature. You know, the, the yin and yang, it's messy and it's, uh, yeah, it works. And uh, we need to, uh, uh, you know, respect it as much as possible. And we're part of it. Absolutely, Absolutely. wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, we're, we're almost, almost, almost out of time. So let's go through everybody and see who's got another question because we certainly can keep on talking. Deepak, you got something? Well, I have a question from you. This is actually a personal question, but I see behind you, there is a symbol of uh, in the Japanese language. It uh, Does it resemble to the snake uh, just on your left side? Uh, actually, that's a, a, a calligraphy from um, the founder of, of, Homi, of, of, of Aikido. Uh, oh, sensei, as we call him. And that is actually uh, uh, the Japanese for Aikido, which is the way of harmony. Okay, that's good. That's really good. Because uh, same symbol I have. Uh, so that's why I'm asking you. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Sure. So you do use a lot of Zen techniques as well in your practice? Sure. I mean, I, I think that, you know, yeah. Uh, having a beginner's mind uh, is very important. Uh, I think that in, in many ways, uh, whether it be Aikido or uh, homeopathy or holistic, anything that th I think that when we deal with something holistic, you know, we're, we're entering that, as you say, that mystical world uh, and very practical mm -hmm. world of Zen, you know. And so uh, I think that, you know, being in the, in the moment, you only can make your solutions in the present. We can't change the past. And I think that if we keep that zooming in and zooming out lens, uh, we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of possibilities. And that's where, as I mentioned before, Im improvisation is, is very important. Uh, and, and it's something that is uh, extremely important because we could celebrate you know, more possibilities. Well, we want you to come back. Well, I sure would love to. That's nice. It's always great. To have. Yeah, just, I totally the agree. Are, the questions are great. Absolutely. And I probably have a million questions for you too, and we can we mutually learn from each okay, other. Okay, next time oh, that's course. what we'll do. Okay, because we <laughs> okay I mean, then soon because I mean you have I mean you've got the the whole I mean you are the whole package. I mean you've got all these techniques, which you know it's all your tools, and it's. It's wonderful. So um, we want you to come back, but you know, and we're gonna have you come back soon. I don't even want to let you go, but Uta, go. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's we all, all have a tool bag. We all have the potential to have a tool bag of uh, wonderful resources, and so we keep on. You have to keep on trying. It's lifelong. In Aikido, we call all our techniques a thousand-year techniques. You know, you're not going to get them right away, but you keep on. You know, you keep on trying, and and. Well, Hence the zoom in, hence the zoom in, zoom out, because right. every time a patient, a client is different, so are we. Yeah. 
exactly. You know, we got to keep on playing that dance. And, you know, um, Uta? Yes, um, I'm taking away from this session uh, the overall term that came up so often uh, for me is holism and we are holistic practitioners and we are holistic uh, beings. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ken. It was a wonderful show, um, very inspirational, um, absolutely fantastic. I'm thrilled we had you on our show. And as Marilyn said, we must have you back. Um, thank you, Preeti. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, Marilyn. I, thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, thank, thank you very, you much. very much. I really, I enjoyed this and you're all very wonderful. Um, nice, nice feeling to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. And for all of you out there, you know, join us each month, the second Tuesday in the month, come to our website because we have all kinds of things going on. We have webinars, we have um, all kinds of talks and conversations. We even have an artsy what do we call it? And what do we call creative it? hour? What is it? Creative hour because we know how yeah. many, you know, we all to be better and better at what we do. We want to be creative, right? Just like you were talking about poetry. We've done poetry. So we, we cover the gamut. So please come visit us. Um, we've just, it, we're a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of connection. And give, give the website address. Oh, thank you. Um, homeopathyworldcommunity.com. Right. And I'd like to point out, if I may, we have coming up on the 11th of March at um, 10 a.m. EST, uh, our very first Facebook Live eye-opener, where we will be talking about grief. So um, I hope you can join us. We're going live on our uh, Facebook page, Homeopathy World Community. Come join us there and see us talk and discuss about the topic of grief, of holding the space, adapting with grief and living peacefully see you then all right everyone and it would be very yeah. nice to have you there too dr ken well, that's great oh, by the way i just remembered for you to, uh, the cuddle uh, uh hormone is oxytocin oxytocin yes oxytocin so let's let's all cuddle we need it we gotta <laughs> yeah. take care of ourselves so <laughs> and then we have a, a, a pretty's going to be doing um a whole course on mammals we've just done one on basic astrology we have one coming up Wonderful. on medical astrology we have a book club meeting this oh, we're doing facial so reading long. we have one on facial <laughs> reading coming up as well <laughs> oh, and these things these um special events that we have are for homeopaths and the general public healers i mean we are we are welcoming we are a community that welcomes in anyone who and, wants and to Marilyn, if, if I may say to if, yes. any, if I could answer any questions, uh, uh, I have a website. It's just under my name, uh, you know, uh, drkensylvestri.com. But I mean, more for just if anyone wants to follow up or ask a question and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I love sharing as much as I can. And I hope. Where can people find your book? Where can they find your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's uh, also in Dana Allman's, uh, uh, home, homeopathic educational services, uh, Amazon probably, you know, also is a, a quick way to get it. Uh, and, you know, Barnes and Nobles and most of your online you know, places. Perfect. And there is a question on here from Jillian. So I am going to send it to you and Jillian, would you please contact, uh, Dr. Ken so he can, um, answer that for you. Great. So with that, everyone. Okay. Ta-ta. Bye. Ta -ta. Well. Bye. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.